listen to The New Paris. I'm your host, Lindsay Tremuda. If you like art or are even mildly interested in art, Paris has both an abundant and intimidating level of choice. The exact number of museums varies according to how you might define a museum, but it's estimated that there are over 130 museums in Paris, including marquee destinations and smaller museums that showcase a wide range of art, history, science, and culture. And if you like or are curious about contemporary art, there are countless galleries and private foundations. Navigating it all, however, can be slightly overwhelming, which is why I wanted to bring on Alex Weinriss, an art industry professional who offers bespoke art experiences through her company, The Scene Paris. In our chat, she speaks to the city's art scene, how she approaches viewing and understanding art, the best small institutions to visit, and what she thinks about immersive exhibitions. Alex, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very happy to be here. We were supposed to do this, if you remember, a long time ago. We were going to do this in 2020 when you got your business up and running. And, you know, we're going to talk about your business today. But obviously, the universe had some different plans. Yes, it did. Um, so before we get to that, though, I guess I want to, you know, because you and I met uh, before well well before covid um but you were someone who had who was a, a more recent arrival in paris but it wasn't your first time living here and you know i remember finding it fascinating that you came from a place um with well first of all perfect sunshine which obviously you're <laughs> you know you have to be a certain person to trade that for what we have here but also you were you were pretty entrenched in the art world where you came from. So give give everybody a backstory as to why were you pulled to Paris mm -hmm. and what were you doing before and how do you sort of bridge those two worlds? Absolutely. You know, I've always been a Francophile by nature. You know, I'm not really sure why I wasn't raised in a particularly uh, French way or with any French relatives. But, uh, you know, I think that my father being an active history buff um, kind of instilled this love of history in me. And then, you know, as someone who was always aesthetically inclined, um, I really loved the attention to detail in France and, you know, this appreciation of beauty and art and food and how that infiltrates kind of every aspect of the culture here. And uh, so I moved out here uh, originally in 2012, um, kind of without a plan, but knowing that I wanted to work in the art world once my French was at a level that I felt uh, was adequate. But you were already um, studying French. I was studying French, yes, when I first moved out here. And uh, I had studied art history and art theory in college in New York at the New School and then came out here and, as I said, you know, wanted to continue in the art world, but uh, wanted to get my French up to snuff. Um, and then uh, I did work in an amazing gallery here in Paris uh, before I unfortunately had to leave for reasons beyond my control and very much against my will to go back. Uh, to my uh, hometown of Los Angeles. And uh, I always knew that I wanted to come back to Paris at some point because I did feel that strong pull and I felt like the values in France were so much more aligned with um, myself and my personal vision of life. And yeah, I, I worked in L.A. for three and a half years at uh, an amazing gallery, uh, but decided, you know, I wanted to come back to Paris and kind of recalibrate. And uh, I didn't really want to continue on the gallery path. I Why is that? What it, what it, What is specific to the gallery path and what it might mean in the U.S.? Yeah, I mean, I was always kind of on the gallery administration, events planning side of things and was kind of on track to climb that ladder of the hierarchy of the of the gallery world. But, you know, I decided not to pursue that path because, you know, the commercial and sales aspect of galleries kind of made me feel increasingly uh, estranged from what 
made me fall in love with art in the first place, which is this sense of connection and sharing ideas and aesthetic appreciation and all of those things I kind of felt like I was losing touch with. It's um, like when you see behind the curtain of it, something, right? Exactly. Yeah. That's what they always say, you know, just uh, it kind of it, it, it cheapens it and it kind of makes it um you, know, you sort of lose sight of what made you fall in love in the first place. Because it can't be all fun and games and glamour and art, you know, like and, and all course. the beautiful stuff all the time. So. Of course. Um, you know, but I also just was missing this human contact with people just talking about art and what they were looking at instead of, you know, calling the directors and saying, you know, oh, come out, there's this person they might have money to purchase a work. Someone needs to come talk to them. I just it, it felt so... Um, I don't know, just not really giving me the opportunity to to connect with people in a real way and and discuss the it's like ideas. Purely, purely transactional. Very transactional. And I, I just, I didn't want to continue down that path. And out of curiosity, because I find this so fascinating for people who, you know, started learning French later, but always had a fascination were you exposed to French art living in, in L.A. or was it mostly through cinema or books that you sort of, I, I mean, I know you said you couldn't put your, like a, your finger on exactly what started the Francophile, the Francophilia, but like, I don't know, for me, I know I could, I could sort of start through the language, but I know other people was like a book that they read or the first movie they saw that may have led them down that path. And I'm always just so curious. Yeah. I mean, it's funny. Actually, it was the language for me. OK, too. so what? that kind of was my entry point into my fascination with France, um, because in seventh grade, when I had the choice to uh, learn right. Spanish or French, uh, you know, being in Southern California, most people chose Spanish. And I was one of like six people that chose French. You're like, and no, let me let me go with the, the lesser. Uh... It, exactly. The language that would not be nearly as useful for me. Well, turned out that it was very sure, useful yeah, for very, me, yeah. <laughs> ultimately. But, you know, being in, in Los Angeles, you know, Spanish was the natural kind of choice for, for almost everyone. And it was really an obvious choice for me, even at that young age. Um, I just was always, like I said, just attracted to the beauty mm. and the sonority of the language and, and the cadence. And it just sounded so sophisticated and elegant. And there, I just, I don't know, it, was, it seemed like a natural choice. Well, and so obviously, you know, if you're if you're a lover of beautiful things, then chances are you're interested in the arts in some way. And, you know, I was thinking um, in, 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 in thinking about your work in art, I was thinking about sort of the areas that I might know I might sort of play around in more, which would be food. Right. Mm -hmm, and so absolutely. you 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 over the years, I've seen the way Paris gets compared to sort of rival cities in the culinary landscape, whether that's London or Tokyo or New York or L.A. And, you know, I think Paris has its own, obviously, its own legacy, but has also had to compete and 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 stay up to date, given that those cities have really risen to the top. And I think, us, you know, fashion's another area where we are so heavily associated with Paris, but also there are other cities that are doing some really innovative things. In art, how does it compare? Like, in, in terms of both the markets, in terms of the maybe level of innovation that happens in, in sort of the types of works that are being displayed, what would you say is sort of the, the defining difference? Um, that's a great question. Uh, you know, historically, Paris was always known as the bastion of the avant-garde, you know, from Impressionism in the 19th century to the birth of modern art in the early 20th century with things like Cubism and Art Nouveau and Art Deco, um, you know, but with the outbreak of World War II in the 1940s, many of those artists were forced out of Europe and France and uh, the lucky ones went to New York and that kind of marked this huge cultural shift um, away from Paris as the center of the you know, art world and visual culture uh, and kind of New York took over for decades um, and kind of left Europe behind. And, uh, you know, and then things started moving to Berlin and London um, and, you know, Paris kind of struggled to reclaim this position as 
an artistic mecca and it was kind of stuck in the glory days of the past, which is why historic museums have always thrived here. But, you know, contemporary galleries have been a little bit slower to take off. Um, You know, I think there's also a reason why uh, the contemporary scene in France has taken so long to come back is it's kind of reflective also of a larger cultural resistance towards change that um, some of us may have sensed in France, <laughs> uh, yeah, particularly kind of a, recently, but right. it's a, been a recurring theme. Yeah, I was just going to say a recurring theme. <laughs> Definitely not a shock to hear that. Yeah, exactly. So I think that, um, like I said, there's this kind of uh, clinging to the past and a resistance towards uh, getting with the current times and competing on a global marketplace. And, you know, contemporary galleries had less of a presence um, here than in cities like New York or Berlin and London. I think there's also a question of uh, new money versus mm-hmm. old money, mm-hmm. um, you know, in financial hubs like New York and London, which tend to attract more buyers of contemporary art, whereas, you know, France tends to lean a little more traditional. So there's still, I mean, you would, you would probably argue then that, you know, the, the, his, for, for those who love all the historic classic stuff, this is a great place. Totally. And, you know, where I'm going with all of this is to say that actually there's been a marked shift in the past, I'd say five to 10 years um, of contemporary art really returning to France and France really kind of re reclaiming its place as uh, a hub of creativity and new ideas. And that's something you explore with food, as you said, and yeah. wine. Um, and there is a shift, but art, it's really becoming much more international here. Um, before it was really locally focused. Um, but now, you know, there's international galleries that are opening up outposts in Paris that never had them before. What was one? Isn't there one that just recently opened? I mean, there's there's been quite a few. There's like, you know, major blue chip galleries like David Zwerner that were never in Paris before, but, you know, are huge, huge galleries. What's almost was shocking that they didn't have a Paris location. Um, and that only opened up, I think, in 2019. OK, so um, there, there's movement. And I mean, Emmanuel Perrotin must be super important in this shift, right? Of course. Yeah. I mean, he's he's a huge name um, and a French gallerist uh, who's gone international himself and uh, represents an international roster of artists. But, you know, everyone from large blue chip galleries to more uh, emerging galleries have set up shop in Paris and a lot of artists are coming back here. Um, You know, New York has become completely unaffordable for artists to live in. Um, Shocking. Yeah, shocking. And, uh, you know, I think that Berlin is not really the gritty arts haven that it was in the 90s. And I think a lot of people are, are coming back to to Paris and artists want to be here and be inspired by the scene that's that's transpiring in, in our fair city. And that's something that you're obviously trying to capture with your business, which is called The Scene. And scene as in S-E-E-N, but it's a nice play on words. Yeah, we know the French love a jeu de mots. So you're you're really <laughs> encompassing a lot in that one in that one name. Um, and you were like I said in the beginning, you were about to launch that in 2020 and then COVID hit. And so for almost a year though, you've been up and running and essentially you tour with clients. You have clients who want to get your take on really interesting and compelling galleries. Obviously, those galleries have shifting collections and, you know, certain artists uh, highlighted at a given time. Um, Tell me a little bit about why this format you felt was the right one. I mean, clearly it was the right time, but nothing like this existed. And, and, And also, you know, was it actually fully missing from the tourism offering in Paris? Yeah, I mean, obviously, this idea stemmed, of course, from my love of Paris and my love of art. But I also really started this project because I noticed how much people were missing out on when they were visiting Paris. 
by sticking to the, you know, well-trodden path of major museums and monuments and tourist hotspots. And, uh, you know, when you view Paris only through the lens of what it was, you really miss out on so much of what it is. So obviously this idea stemmed from uh, my love of the city of Paris and my love of art. But I really started this project because I noticed how much uh, people were missing out on um, when they were visiting Paris by sticking to this kind of tired, well-trodden path of museums and monuments and tourist hotspots. And, you know, when you view Paris only through this lens of what it was, you kind of miss out on so much of what it is. Absolutely. Yeah. And Of course, we're all in awe of its rich history, and that that goes without saying almost. Um, But I was really seeking to find a bridge between Paris's past and Paris's present. And that's what I hope to offer clients in, in my experiences with them. You know, I wanted to give them kind of a more holistic vision of the city and offer them access to things they might not think of on their own. Right. And to reveal Paris in in more depth than just this kind of myopic vision of Emily in Paris. Oh God! Uh, oh God! <laughs> I know those are dangerous words. They're, to say they're really you. <laughs> triggering. Trigger warning. Tr- trigger warning. <laughs> but also, I mean, I think I think you're tapping into something, or you've tapped into something, which is that there are people who are intimidated. I myself have always been intimidated by contemporary galleries. It's kind of like going into a high end jewelry store and sort of being looked up and down and unsure how to behave in those spaces. And I think some people who might be curious need a little bit of a helping hand in navigating them. Yeah. And, and you know, actually, you took me, so I took one of your tours, and it happened to be clearly the best one because yeah, it was of, of, good. I can't lie. of who was who was there that time. Um, we went to, what is it called again? The, the, te- the, Templon, that's right. And yeah. it was Jeanne Visceral, who's this incredible artist. Visceriane. Visceriane. <laughs> but it is visceral as well. Right. It's, you know why I said that? It's because I remember we made the comment about her name that yes. it almost reads like visceral, like yeah. visceral. So anyway, I hope she won't. She won't hold it against you. She won't hold it against me. Okay, Um, (laughs) but but you know she was there, and I know that doesn't happen every time that you have a visit. Unfortunately, not. When it's possible, the you know people might get to meet an artist who happens to be present, Mm -hmm. and and her work was astounding. And you know, I'm someone who doesn't always fully understand contemporary art, Um, but this was like right up my alley. I mean, it was a commentary on women's rights and women's bodies, and using. Uh, inspiration and expertise from the textile world. I mean, it was just, it was so powerful. Um, And I'll, in the show notes, I'll link to some stuff so people can get a sense of her work. But, you know, so that that is like one example. And then you can go to plenty of other places that have a little bit more of a, maybe an abstract selection of works. But, you know, how are you choosing each time and Mm -hmm. are you are you is it fully based on what the client wants or what if the client doesn't know what they want yep that's something that i often ask clients in advance um which is you know what are you looking for out of this experience and you know um some people tell me that they just want to figure out what it is that they like because some people don't even know what they like because they haven't had enough exposure and as you mentioned the contemporary art world can feel extremely intimidating and uh, exclusionary. And uh, I feel like they are often these very cold, unwelcoming places, especially, you know, as an American who might not speak French. And uh, I think that contemporary art in general can be very over people's heads they feel like they don't get it they feel like uh somehow they're missing something and they don't see what they're supposed to be seeing and we talked about this on the tour but sometimes the press releases that are available in galleries about an an exhibition are are illegible i can't i mean they're incomprehensible and you know they're string together 50 words to say the most simple thing but it makes you feel like somehow you're (laughs) inadequate because you can't decipher what it's trying to say and 
I don't know who their audience is with that kind of text, but, you know, there is an air of kind of inaccessibility and, and elitism that's right. very um, deterring for people, but they still want to they, they know there's something to it and they know there's something that they want to uh, unpack there, but they just don't really know how to access it. So that's kind of where I come in and I can serve as a liaison between my clients and these gallery spaces and the gallery staff. And hopefully, if we're lucky, the artists and I can kind of demystify this world a little bit and and show that it, it is accessible and uh, there is a lot of discovery to to be made. And, and, you know, just as an example, on our particular tour, it was also, um, we went to, oh gosh, I'm going to butcher it, the, the, the second gallery where there was the Pakistani artist. Uh, yes, Al Minraik. Right. So, you know, all of this is in a particular neighborhood. It's not, you know, it, there isn't just one neighborhood, obviously, where all these galleries are located, but I'm sensing a far more international uh, intention Right. So Mm -hmm. these galleries hosting all these, you know, foreign artists as well, many of whom are just starting to become known in their home countries. In this case, she works in Brooklyn, Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, because she can't work in Pakistan. Right. Um, And 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 I think that's a a, a sign of also where things are going, that there's there's a more global leaning. And, you know, obviously it took ages for that to feel fully in place in the food world. And now, you know. It sounds like there's a real palpable sense of a global vision in art. Totally. And there's so many more international artists being exposed now. And um, there's there are a lot of uh, international artists being represented right now by these international galleries that are moving to Paris. There's a lot of emphasis on international artists, a lot of emphasis on on female artists. Um, there's just a, a broadening of of the contemporary art world that's really exciting right now. And to what extent do you think, I mean, we've obviously talked about these small galleries, but there are also private art institutions that have become very uh, well known in the landscape. I mean, specifically the the Louis Vuitton Foundation and the Pinot Collection. Um, and, you know, since Paris and, and France overall, for the most part, are, you know, dominated by public institutions, you know, this it, having these private institutions raises all sorts of questions about, you know, what, you know, what the value is compared to most of the U.S., which is all private, mm-hmm. privately funded uh, art institute, or art collections, art galleries. Um, but are these places where you might see more of this foreign talent that that also has a sort of platform? Or, you know, how do you see their their value in the in the wider art world? Yeah, that's a that's an interesting thing to consider. I mean, these private art foundations are injected with private money principally from the founder, which is why the founders are usually billionaires. Mm. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, France, I think, has less of these private foundations than the U.S., uh, partly because the government here gives more money to the arts. But, you know, nevertheless, these these private museums are, are popping up more commonly here and give these mega collectors an, an opportunity to to show the breadth of their collection. And it is exciting because oftentimes while they mix it in with some really, you know, uh, important artists that have incredibly high valued work, they also tend to include more emerging artists that are on the precipice of of blowing up. There definitely is value in in having their collections exposed because, you know, despite what you might think of them as people, <laughs> um, they Fair do point. sincerely love art. And um, I think the value in having these um, these foundations is that it gives these mega collectors an opportunity to control their collection more, um, to avoid it from going to auction or to, um, you know, sometimes if they donate it to a public museum, only five to 10 percent of it gets exhibited. And when you've spent so much time and money in developing your collection, you kind of want the whole thing to be to be shown. Um, and so, you know, I, I I like these museums. I think that they, you know, 
are are if I mean, if you're going to collect art and have that much of it, like better to have it on display for people to see than to hoard it in your giant mansions or in a you know, stockpile on the Cayman Islands uh, <laughs> in your tax haven. Right. I mean, it's true that even they get tax incentives for even of putting course. it in a museum. But yeah, I think it's probably better than, you know, you're giving back in a way. Totally. In one way, at yeah. least, uh, versus... I mean, some of them, not in, in France, I don't think, but uh, definitely, I know in Los Angeles, the, the Broad Museum is owned by, you know, mega multi-billionaire um, Eli Broad, and it's free to get into that museum. You make a good point. It isn't currently free to go it to isn't. either of those museums. No, no. And I'm curious if they're going to push things in that direction or not, because I'm, you know, obviously they need they need the the funds to pay their staff and, and keep things afloat. But come in, <laughs> come in. <laughs> um, well, this brings brings an interesting point. Well, first of all, I wanted to add also that those those two institutions in particular are are beautiful architectural works as well and so like even if you're not super inclined to spend time discovering contemporary art there's like another value in going to see them i think the pinot collection is astounding and in, in you know in that old bourse de commerce building you know it was an old grain uh, building right i mean it's just a, it was a grain yeah i think uh, it was the some grain, sort of agricultural yes. trading space grain trade that's yeah. right that's right um but, you know, there are other kinds of spaces that um, that have, have emerged in, in the city. And I wanted to ask you about this just because it's so fresh. There was this New York Times story that was just published over the weekend about immersive art I- exhibitions. And many of them actually began in France with this organization called Culture Space or Culture Spaces. So people might know the Atelier des Lumières in Paris or the Carrière des Lumières in Provence held in a rock quarry. And the article basically suggests that these experiences are beloved by, by visitors and panned by critics, which mm. I think is sort of like how typical that what the general public loves, you know, the art elites have to say this isn't worthy. What do you make of them? Well, I'm kind of of two minds about it. I, uh, in one sense, can appreciate the beauty of seeing these works displayed in a in a new and highly sensory manner, you know, often in really remarkable spaces like a rock quarry. I actually have been to that one. Yeah, me Provence. too. Um, I've never been to the one in Paris. Um, I think it's but, a bit more impressive, the one in Provence. Because... Yeah, I mean, that's such an exceptional and unique space. Yeah. Where you wouldn't normally see art, whereas, you know, I think the one in Paris is... Uh, it's is an like old a, factory. Yeah, but... it's a factory. Um, but, you know, still, it's, a, it's an interesting space and seeing this art projected and kind of having a full sensory experience, you know, I can see the that the mise en scène is really impressive and enjoyably kind of detached from the sometimes pedantic nature of art institutions. Um, but, you know, in another in another sense, I kind of find them a little corny. Right. That's um, the problem. You know, is... like sort of a marketing angle. It's the Disney of art. Totally. Right? It's, you know, kind of feels like you're walking through a, a giant screensaver. Um, yes. You know, the screen. Yeah, yeah, it does. Removed <laughs> from all context and, you know, presenting the work of great artists with no real point of view. There's no there's no context. They don't tell you anything about the artist or the history. And we're talking about like uh, Picasso, Degas. They did a Van Gogh one. They did, um, I think, a Klimt one. And um, I'm sure they I can't even remember the one that I saw in Poland. But we're talking about classics. Major, major artists. Um, So, you know, maybe there's a general sense that people kind of have some background going into it. But at the same time, I don't know, just seeing it removed from all context, context, it kind of feels just cheapened. I mean, I guess it's good for young kids. Totally great for kids. I think for adults, you know, I have people, I have clients who ask me about it occasionally. And, you know, I certainly wouldn't accompany one of my clients <laughs> to Atelier de Lumière because they don't need me because right. the whole point is to not dig deeper. It's right. just about the pure entertainment and enjoyment of um, some sort of visual spectacle taking place in front of you. And that's pretty the, much the extent of the interaction. But I will say that you, uh, I mean, we've talked about this, you started out doing just contemporary galleries, but actually you've opened up a bit and are taking people to uh, smaller museums as a way 
for people maybe to have a mix of old and new and 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 really go further in that experience um and actually if people are subscribed or are not yet subscribed but should subscribe to my newsletter there will be three places that alex loves um on top of what we're discussing today so it's at bonjour.lindsaytremuda.com and i'll put, put that in the show notes as well but just to say that you mix old and new totally you got the sense that people really wanted more of a balance yeah exactly i mean even for me looking at contemporary art all day can be a little exhausting and i think it's nice to to vary the pace um by you know seeing something historical and then kind of somehow linking it to the contemporary work that you know, I like to show clients. I think that's a really nice bridge. You know, for example, the other day, um, I took clients to see an exhibition of 12 female artists uh, at the Gallery Camille Menor, which is a contemporary art gallery. Um, and these 12 female artists were focusing on the male nude um, throughout the course of history. And um, one of the artists that was featured in the exhibition, um, Germaine Richier, she is um, an artist that worked for the sculptor Antoine Bourdel. Um, and Antoine of the Bourdel, Bourdel Museum. Exactly. The, the museum, the Bourdel Museum just reopened. And... Uh, I thought that was an interesting parallel to, you know, show one of the artists in a contemporary context and then visit a museum where she was actually the atelier where she worked with the sculptor Antoine Bourdel. And, uh, you know, I just think I like to draw those kind of uh, those those parallels. And sure. F- like we said earlier, you know, bridge these two worlds and bridge Paris's past to Paris's present. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention the food element here because not that this is obligatory on any of your tours, but there's obviously the option to sort of add a meal on uh, to the experience, usually lunch, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And I know that we went to La Grande Brasserie together. That's at Bastille, and that's a really nice sort of revival brasserie with um, these incredible, like, near turn of the century i think it was like the 20s right the interior parts of it were the 20s parts over the 40s yeah, but like exactly. just stunning tile and 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 wallpaper work mm-hmm. um, mirrors why is it important for you like how do you choose the places i guess that you're going to choose for a meal in a way that it reflects sort of the artistic choices totally um you know first and foremost i take into consideration a client's interests. Um, If they're really into wine, I'll take them to a place that has an amazing wine list. Or, you know, if they want something really traditionally French, I'll take them to a place that does the classics, but does them exceptionally well. In general, I I like to take clients to a place they wouldn't necessarily find on their own. um, And that has an original or authentic point of view on, on food. But Obviously, I can't deny the fact that aesthetics also play a play yeah. a big role in my selection. Um, you know, I want the space to 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 present beautiful design or ooze Parisian charm to give people really a sense of place to feel like they're having a unique experience that couldn't be had anywhere else. You know, I think there's nothing worse than going to a restaurant feeling like I could be anywhere right now. Um, I think people really want to have a sense of place um, when they're dining. And uh, I think that that goes into my considerations a lot. Well, I mean, it makes for a a super two to three hour or longer, right? I mean, yeah, I I offer half day experiences, which usually range from three to four hours and then a full day, which is like seven hours usually. And, you know, in the full day, we have to have a lunch. Otherwise, we'll collapse. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Um, but I find it's just a nice way to break things up, break up the day, have an opportunity for discussion. You know, it's a little bit um, it just changes the vibe completely when people want to share a meal together or yeah. um, even have a drink. Um, sometimes clients will just request to have a drink afterwards um, and we can discuss the, what we saw. And uh, yeah, that's it's a pretty complete day. Yeah, I like to curate the the experience from start to finish. So I guess I'm going to I'm going to give you a, a bit of a challenge here. If you had only one day in Paris, what one or two art institutions or spaces would you sort of say are 
your personal crucial non-negotiable? Interesting. Good question. I might be chastised for saying this, but I would I would completely skip the Louvre or the Musée d'Orsay. Um, and I would go check out some smaller kind of historical museums that are kind of under the radar and are, you know, have brilliant collections and interesting exhibitions. I love places like the Musée Gustave Moreau, Mm -hmm. um, which is just spectacular um, architecturally. And Moreau is an artist that is kind of woefully uh, under-recognized, but was really important to a lot of artists that followed him. I mean, he was Matisse's teacher. Yeah, more people should know that. Exactly. Um, And it's in his family home. It's really spectacular. It's small. It's seven euros to get in and gives you discounted tickets if you want to go visit the Opéra Garnier or the Musée d'Orsay, actually. Ah, bah voilà. Voilà. Um, So, you know, I love that museum or I love the Musée Montmartre, actually. It's so charming and recreates an artist studio from uh, the 20th century, uh, Suzanne Valadon. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, they also do really interesting, very digestible and scale exhibitions um, at the Musée Montmartre, which I like. They currently have one up about women in surrealism, which I think I mean, is come on. great. Yeah. Uh, I haven't seen it yet, but I'm really looking forward to going. Well, that's your turf up yeah, there. Yeah, totally up. That's my turf. I just stroll around Montmartre as much as I can. So, And also people should really follow you on Instagram because your photos are beautiful and Thank they make you. me want to... Not just stay in the 11th arrondissement, <laughs> although my inclinations are to stay in the 11th arrondissement. I mean, I'm there's, teasing. But... There's plenty to do in the 11th yeah, arrondissement, in all but fairness. There, there's something that almost feels like, you know, on the in the times when I do get myself up to Montmartre, I'm like, oh, yeah, this is this is something like really special it about is. this city. And it's very much a village. And totally. I, I don't know. I mean, and that's the beauty of this city, right? You can have 100 different experiences in different parts of town exactly but people really need to follow you your account is the scene paris seen as the past tense of to see right don't worry it will be in the show notes as well and i i just think you 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 have a very unique perspective and and certainly you you highlight some things from your tours as you go along so Usually in stories, in the you know, in the temporary ephemeral yes. part of Instagram. I know, so I've people been told I need to do more reels. Yeah, I'm but you know on what? It. You know what? I think uh, people either see it or they don't, and then they just have to come and book a tour with you if they that miss it. Is true. So people can connect with you to talk about a tour or, t- or some version of an experience with you. And- Absolutely. I mean, everything I do is bespoke and tailored to what the client is interested in. If they want to learn more about contemporary art, if they already know about contemporary art, but they just want to dig deeper, whatever their interest is, I'm here to accommodate and to help provide a really enriching experience in Paris that goes you know, beyond the obvious and, and takes you into the world of Paris that made me fall in love with it and want to spend my life here. So oh. there's nothing I love more than transmitting that love to other people and kind of, you know, transmitting that that sense of wonder that I still have walking through the city. And that's, you know, what that's I try why to we're convey here. through my Instagram, you know, and and through the photos that I take. I've been here, as I said, you know, over the span of 10 years and I... Uh, I'm it's, still in love with it. I'm right. still enchanted by it. So. Well, that means you're the that's the right kind of person to be leading people around because you you know, feeling that wonder is uh, something you can't manufacture. So Totally. Good for you for doing Thank something you. like this, Merci Alex. Merci beaucoup. So good to have you on. Thank and you for uh, allowing me to have my podcast debut with you. <laughs> my absolute Watershed pleasure. moment. A uh, huge, huge. <laughs> we'll remember this day. And for those listening, again, you can find extra tips from Alex that will be on my newsletter this week uh, at bonjour.lindsaytremuda.com. And again, that will be in the show notes. And until next time, à bientôt. That's the show for today. Thanks for listening, as always. If you're streaming this on Spotify, be sure to check out a little poll that awaits you pertaining to this discussion. Just scroll down on the episode page within the app and vote. And if you enjoy the show, I'd love it if you'd subscribe, share with a friend, and pick up the books that inspired it, The New Paris and The New Parisienne. Until next time, à bientôt.